Jonah 3 and 6. The word is about to be preached. The lost are about to be reached. The hurting will be held. God's promises will be kept. The enemy will be demoralized. God will be glorified. I will be edified. I believe it. I receive it. I stand on it. And I live by it. When I hear the word, I will apply it. And I'll be transformed by it. In the book of Jonah, the third chapter, and verse 6, this is after Jonah began to preach to them. The Bible says, The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and removed his robe, and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And when God saw what they did, what they did how they turned from their evil way. God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them and he did not do it. He did not do it. Y'all know I like to stay inside of sermon series. I'm still there. Necessity produces consecration. Necessity produces consecration. If any man speak, let him speak of the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. We, we all know the story of Jonah, how he sent to preach to Nineveh, and how God begins to use him. And we'll go later on to the full story, but how God begins to use him and how he is going to, at that point, begin to speak to them. And what we don't talk about sometimes is the response that they had. The Bible says that the king himself sits down in sackcloth and ashes and he sends out this decree and he says, you know, we're going to fast for three days. Even the animals will fast for three days because they had a need. They knew what was going to happen to them and they said, you know, maybe if we were truly repent and consecrate ourselves, maybe the disaster that was on its way will be turned away. Can I preach to y'all today, and I'm going to jump up and get out of here. Can I preach to y'all and tell you this, that there's sometimes a disaster that is assigned to our lives. And God sends a word of consecration to us first. And God says, if you begin to be serious and consecrate, what was meant to happen won't happen. What you deserve will not happen. Because consecration is essential to our relationship with God. Amen. Consecration is essential to our relationship with God. And what is consecration? I, I, I don't want to just preach about these things as though everybody understands what these things are, right? We have to make sure we break down words because sometimes we say we're doing this for the unchurched. But sometimes church people don't even know what it means. Amen. And we use these terms and we keep using these terms, but we don't even truly know what it means as well. But to consecrate means to devote yourself to a purpose with or as if with deep seriousness or dedication. I devoted myself to something. I have deep seriousness about it and deep dedication. Consecration is the act of setting something or someone apart for a sacred service. So it's, it's putting something aside for a sacred service. In the Bible, consecration is closely tied to the concept that we talk about in church. One, consecration is, told, is, is closely tied to sanctification. Yes, amen. Amen. Uh, you, it is closely tied to surrender. I yes, like that yes. one. Uh, to holiness and to devotion. Without consecration, you cannot be sanctified. All right. Amen. Uh, so you just can't. Say, being sanctified is not the church you go to. Amen. amen. It is not what the, what the sign says on the outside. But, but sanctification means that you are consecrated. I will break that down because, you know, if you're holding something back, then therefore you 
not surrender. Right. See, when, when, when you surrender to the police officer, they say, do you have any weapons on you? And they make sure you have to give up all your weapons. Yeah. If I keep a weapon on me, y'all better hit me, I not get surrendered. And what I plan on doing is doing something to you once you bring me inside of there. And I don't trust you just right now. Yeah. And, and, and if we really are surrendered to God, we give him everything. everything. Uh -huh. You cannot be holy and not be consecrated. You cannot be truly, hit this word right here, you cannot be truly devoted and not be consecrated. It's more than just coming to church. It's what you do when you leave here. Amen. On the inside. But, but, but if you want to see God, you must be holy. Yes. I, you know, you know, that, the Bible is very clear on that, right? So, so here when I say this. Hebrews 12 and 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. If we want to truly see God, that means to truly have a true relationship with him, we must be holy. And to be holy, I need to see God. Because the only way I can be holy, I got to see what holy looks like. That's right. That's it. See, the only way I can be holy, I got to see God. So therefore, I got to see what holiness looks like. Therefore, we have a need, right? That's right. So we all need to be holy. Am I being real in here? We all need to be holy. And so therefore, our need should produce consecration in our lives. For me to be holy, I must give up something that is inside of me that is not like God. Right? I separate myself, and so therefore, I have a need. And so that need produces something inside of me. So now that need says, Daniel, you, you got to consecrate. Come on, that's right, that's right. I don't care if you're an elder banker. I don't care if you're the pastor. I don't care if you're the deacon, mother, uh, saint, elder, or friend. It does not matter. I don't care what you are. Guess what? If you want to be holy, there's a need. You have got to consecrate. recognize their need to have forgiveness from God. Yes. Yeah. They realize, like, hey, I need forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I, I need to have forgiveness. Jonah was sent by God. Right? But the Bible says he ran from God. Yes. Right. right? And he's on the ship, and he's on the ship, and they realize that it's you. Yep. See, you you're the reason why we're going to perish. So they throw him overboard into the sea. And then, when he's ready to die, he think that's it. A great fish begin to swallow him. And the Bible says he stays in the belly of the fish for three days. Yeah. While in the belly of the fish, he begins to repent. It's funny how sometimes things can happen in our lives to make us see God, right? And then sometimes God says, you know, God says, you could have died in the surf. You could have died in the, in the waves. But guess what? I had something to come in and to rescue you. But it rescued you to make you realize that if you do not begin to come back and repent, you will face certain destruction. And then when he repented, the Bible says the, the fish begin to throw him up. Mm -hmm. it, it, it served his purpose, right? Can, can I preach to y'all and I tell you this? That your circumstance has a purpose. And that when you when God gets out of you, what he needs to hear from you. Come on now, Pastor. Come on. And we wonder sometimes why I'm still in the same situation because God says, you have not yet said what I need you to say. You not yet have a heart the way I want you to have a heart. And one that happens, whatever has you will throw you up. Because it cannot hold you anymore. Oh, y'all better get me inside it. It cannot hold you anymore because it, it was only there for a purpose. The fish did not swallow him of his own accord. The fish was sent by God for a purpose. I'll preach to you when I say this. That guess what? Your circumstances did not come on their own accord. Your trials did not come on their own accord. They had a purpose. And when the purpose is fulfilled, you got to go. put on the dry ground, he covered a three-day journey in one day. And unlike me, unlike me, he then goes and delivers a sermon that lasted less than two minutes. <laughs> you ever read what he told him? You ever read the whole sermon? It don't take very long at all. Because really, in all honesty, I'm going to preach this up on, I don't think Jonah want them to repent. And the Bible says he did not want them to repent. So he didn't really work hard on this sermon. He, he, he did what we say sometimes. I'm going to give you what God told me to give you, and I'm going to be gone. <laughs> give him a very short sermon. Yes. This, this two-minute sermon mm -hmm. right. was so powerful yeah. enough to convict the king of Nineveh so much that he repented and called a three-day fast for everything in his kingdom. Everything. Come on. We're not going to even feed the animals here. We are going to seek God. Oh, I'm going to hear this. Why? Because he recognized 
recognized that his, he recognized his and his people's need to be forgiven. And that need produced a level of consecration that may seem extreme, but it was necessary. That's why I don't tell people when they go into consecration that I wouldn't do that. I think you're going too far. Unless the Lord tell me that. Now the Lord said, look, they're going too far. You need yeah. to talk to them, right? Yeah. But, but beside that, I watch what I say because what may be extreme for me yeah. may be just what you need. Yeah. What may be extreme for, for you may be necessary for me. Yeah. Mm. See, that's a personal thing. Because I know the reason why some of y'all are holding your claps right now, y'all a little nervous. You think Pastor's about to put you in a consecration. Uh -huh. I don't know why you're scared because you ain't going to do it anyway. That everybody is saying they're Christian now. It's okay. I don't, I don't talk about those things. That, that, that's, that's them. I don't, I don't condemn them. That's them. But, but I, I wonder, you know, are you serious about yeah. the relationship? Because, yeah. see, I can be married but not be serious about my wife. Come on now. Right. Come on. I've learned that, you know. She can be married and not take me seriously. That's right. And, you know, if we're in a relationship with God. We can be in a relationship but not take him serious. Come on, come on, come on. Right? That, 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 that what he asks us to do, we don't do it. Yeah. We do not submit. You know, you know, in a marriage, both sides gotta submit. You say, well, Pastor, you the man, you don't submit. Oh yes. Right. Cause sometimes God says, You better listen to her. Yeah. 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 And, and if I want her to submit to me, I must be listening to God. That's right. Amen. Right. Amen. Am I being right? Y'all been quiet here, man. Y'all just want to say, whatever I say go. Because the Bible says I'm the head of the household. I'm the head of the wife. Well, you got to understand something now. That if you are not representing God the right way, y'all going to hear me. Then destruction comes upon us. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know? so, so I wonder, God says, do you take me seriously? And then I wonder if our response to conviction is still consecration. Uh, it used to be when we got convicted that we changed something in our lives. Yep, yep, amen, yep. Something had to be different. Something had to move in our lives. And then our response to conviction cannot be uh, just ignoring God. Yeah. Our response to conviction cannot be, I'll put it off till later on. But when you are truly convicted of something in your life, something has to go on the altar. Yeah. Uh, something has to be given to God. Does our need still make us set ourselves apart? Because I need to have God in my life. So therefore, certain things I just cannot do. Because I want to take a deeper look at consecration. A deeper look, right? Consecration requires some actions on our part. Right? It requires some action on our part. And if you want to write these down, I'm going to try my best to talk slowly as so you can write them down. But, but the first one is, consecration involves giving something to God. Consecration involves giving something to God. All right? That, that, that's the first thing that consecration does. We have to give something to God. How much is your relationship with God worth to you? Yeah, come on now. Because I love Jesus. For God I live and for God I will die. Yeah. Don't we say it so quickly all the time? Yeah. For God I live and for God I'll die. But God says, but you can't even give me an hour of your day. And I'm, I'm just being honest because I'll preach to me too inside of here. That God says, you can get so busy. And you know, us uh, the uh, Christians who, who, who ain't, you know, just out there partying no more. And out there, you know, getting drunk and, and riding this living in our old life. And so then we say, well, because I'm not sinning, that means that good, therefore I'm good with God. But just because you're not in, in this, this great sin does not mean that you have time for God. Come on, Pastor. Come on. Hear me when I say that. It does not mean that you don't have time for God. God says, I would 
to make you to still make sure that when I ask you to give me something, yes. give me those things. Yes. Yes. Whatever you cannot give up for God is more to you than God. And that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. So I cannot, you know, decide that I will consecrate this hour for God. Preacher. If I cannot decide and say, Lord, I'm going to give you this time. I'm going to give you this thing in my life that I know it may be lawful. I mean, preach to y'all. Because the Bible says all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. That means they're not beneficial. And so therefore, I may give you, I said, Lord, you know, it's okay for me to do this. But God says, no, you need to give that thing up. Because it messes with you. It is destroying your life. And God says, if you cannot give it up, it's worth more to you than me. That's a problem. All of us, man. God said, you know, can, can you, you know, you, you have it, but can you give it up? I, I, I was telling somebody that, you know, yeah, well, you never heard. I like shoes. You heard before. Anyway. And so, I had to get to a point that God says, I need you to give some away. Oh, wow. All right. Just give them away. Amen. Don't, 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 you know, just give them away. I went to my, my room, and, and my, 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 my little niece is there, and, and she was saying, did y'all sell shoes? I said, you know, in my room, y'all see, he's got, like, shoes on the wall and everything. And, and I'm like, you know, I said, you know, you, you know, I, yeah, appreciate you. Anyway, but, um, so what happened is, I had someone to come to my house, and I had been giving away some shoes, and God said, you gotta, do not be so, so hoarding things sometimes. It's okay to have things, but you got to be able to let them go. Amen. And I said, well, Lord, why? Why can't I give them go? God said, no, no, I, I have to know that if I can bless you with something, oh you can release those things. Yes. And when you cannot release what I bless me you with, don't expect me to give it back to you. Can, can, I, mm, can I say this? Y'all don't really get mad at me. Some of y'all, God wants to bless y'all with vehicles. But you couldn't get the vehicle away. Come on. And what happened was, mm, got quiet in there. And what happened was, you begin to negotiate with God. God. Well, I gave him a good deal. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And God says, if you can't get it, oh, yeah. God, him. God says, sometimes even finances, God says, I didn't tell you to loan them that money. Oh, I told you. I told you to give them that money. Right. Right. You told them to pay me that hand. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, come on, Pastor. And we wonder why. Stop. Right. So I had a situation with the shoes. Right. God, you know, I'd give some away, but you know, you get to pick the ones you give away, right? right. Come on now. You get to pick the ones you give away. God told me to go in there and said, Look on the wall. Mm -hmm. Which ones do you want? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, that, 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 you know there's the wall and the floor. Uh -huh. The ones on the wall are like, Yeah. yeah. The ones on the floor, they're good. But the wall is like, eh. yeah, God says, I want to make sure. It's on a small level. You say, well, Pastor, that's something small. No, 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 no. It's showing that I can be obedient. And that what's there is not going to take away my obedience to God. Because if I'm disobedient in small things, you better hear me. If I can ignore God's voice in what you think is small, then therefore when the big things happen, I'm going to ignore him then. Oh, so when God told you to go and put $20 in a person's hand, you're like, Lord, I don't got it my own self. And you wonder why when you ask God, God said that money was more to you, that money was worth more to you than mine, than your obedience to me. And so therefore, you need to consecrate. Y'all wonder why we have these meetings on finances and everything like that because you say, well, Pastor, why we need meetings on finances? Because I've learned something that if you can be obedient in that, you can be obedient in greater things too. That's right. Consecration is a deliberate act of devotion. Amen. Consecration is a deliberate act of devotion. Amen. It's not mistakes. It is, it is a deliberate act of devotion. It is not what you give up by accident or by simply forgetting. Yeah. Amen. You know, it is not what you just give up by accident that, that you even notice. It is what you intentionally do to devote yourself to God and to the service of his will. It's not something I do by accident. It is a deliberate thing that I do. I intentionally uh, devote myself to God to the service of his will. It is something that I must be thinking and knowing that I'm going to do. Consecration is linked to spiritual discipline. Thank you. Amen. I learned I'm not impressed by your
your gift anymore. Yeah. I'm not impressed by people's talents anymore. Amen. I met gifted, I met talented people, but I want to know, are you spiritually disciplined? I want to know that when you get through praying in front of people, can you pray at home? I want to know that, that, that after you get through preaching to people, do you preach to yourself at home? Do you begin to say, Lord, give me a sermon that's going to hit me? Hallelujah. When I read the word this morning, Lord, I need something going to tear me up. Y'all better hear me. I need something going to begin to rock me to my core and say, you got to be better. I need something, Lord, I need, I need to know that when I give to us, y'all better hear me when I say this, that whatever I'm doing, that if I'm bold, Sit down. Years ago. That's right. This was a man. I said, 
said, I'd advise you, look, you need to take a little break right now. Because, you know, they were like, no, I can't do it. Because people going to see me a certain way. Oh, my God. I told them, I said, what heaven or hell do they have to put you in? Football. 
And guess what happens? They're going to put you where they need you to be. And they put them where they need to be. Boy, the place of cornerback. That boy was awesome at that. In basketball, he's not very tall. He played the five in the post position, my wife. They got another on, 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 in the paint. But guess what? He plays basketball. Anything like we do, anything like some people, well, you know what? I'm going to play point guard, I won't play at all. Uh-huh. And guess what happens? You're there for your purposes. But when you're there for the team, put me where you want to put me, coach. Wherever you need me to be, I'm going to do that. I told y'all before, my, my prayer in the morning times are now very short. I pray very small prayers in the morning because I say the same thing every morning. Lord, I present to you my body. Y'all better hear me. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto you. Lord, do with me what you want to do with me today. That's it. When I wake up, I'm not asking him for anything. I say, Lord, I present to you my body. A living sacrifice. So therefore, if I tell you I'm open to what you want to do with me today, you're going to take care of me. You're going to make sure I get back and forth to work if I have an assignment. Y'all better hear me. You're going to make sure I'm able to do what I do if I have an assignment. I just want to be in the game. Yes. Amen. Can y'all, can y'all say that sometimes? Lord, I just want to be a part of the body. Amen. Don't matter. I know what part I want to be, but Lord, just let me be a part of the body. Let me be a part. Hallelujah. Mm. Oh my God. Just pleasure to be in the service yes. one more time. Come on. Come on. Get this. Customers is about setting yourself aside for God's purpose of living a life dedicated to His service. That's right. It is an act of surrendering oneself completely to God's will yes, and submitting yourself to His authority. Yes. Not what I want to do. His authority. He has the last say. Right. The concept of consecration in the Bible is closely related to sanctification, which means to make holy or to set apart for God. It is a process of transformation that occurs through the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. So therefore, that when I begin to consecrate, it's because not because I want to do. It's because the Holy Spirit gets inside of me and makes me do what I don't want to do. It gives me the ability to do what I don't want to do sometimes. That's the helper. Amen. That's right. That's the helper. That is something that gives me the ability to do. Lord, I don't want to do it, but the Holy Ghost says, you know what? You can do it. I got you if you need it. I got you if you need it. If you need some help, you need some more power, I got you. Get this. The Holy Ghost pushes us to consecrate because we are vessels of God. Somebody say vessels. Vessels. I want to read something to you real quick. Exodus 49 says, and thou shalt make the anointing oil. And anoint the tabernacle. The whole thing you going to anoint it. This is Moses talking to the people. And all that is therein. And thou shalt hallow it. And all the vessels. Somebody say vessels. vessels. The vessels thereof. And it shall be holy. Yes. My God. He don't do like this when we dedicate the house to God. Okay. You know. Not what we do. We go anoint the dope posts. Yeah. I've done it before. I've left people house before. You go anoint the rooms and all that. The Bible says. <laughs> He said, when you bless this temple, don't just bless the building. Bless the vessels inside of it. That took time. They blessed every dish. They blessed every candlestick. Every utensil that was in there, they said, am I right? He said, and all the vessels there are. And then they shall be holy. Y'all ready? We cannot focus so much on the church being holy that we forget about the vessels. We cannot focus so much that, Lord, I want them to respect the church. No, Lord, I want them to respect you. And the vessels are holy, the church will be holy. We are the vessels, and we must be consecrated for God's use on an individual level. It's not just about the house of God. It's about the people of God. If the vessels are holy, the house will be holy. You better hear me. And our mind has to be made up on the Lord, and our loyalties cannot be divided. Mm-hmm. Our loyalties cannot be divided. Get this in Matthew 6 and 24. This is what Jesus said. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will devote to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Now, let me go ahead and give you guys some context. In the, in the Hebrew language, they, remember, they don't have a word for loving less. That's why I said, you love one or hate the other. Yeah. We said, you know, Jacob I love, Esau I hate. Technically, he didn't hate Esau. It's just he liked to eat Jacob more. Amen. It is what it is, you know. He had a pity. That's all it was. They, they, they don't, that love and hate.
hate is different for them. Because, you know, and so therefore, God said, nothing wrong with liking money. But money cannot come before me. Because y'all don't hate money. Go ahead and tell me y'all, you don't hate money. I know, I know. Be real. If you hate it, please send it my way. I, I, will, I will lessen your burden. Please, I, if you don't like it, leave me. One man's trash is another man's trash. No, you don't hate money, but you learn context in it. You learn priorities, don't you? That I cannot love money more than I love God. That's what messes people up. That even when you get people in certain positions, the reason why they begin to begin to sit in a position where money corrupts them, they make bad decisions, is not because they just hate, they just love money. They just love money more than love God. Because if you love God more than money, you won't make those decisions, will you? You won't be embezzling, will you? You won't be keeping something back that's not yours, will you? Because I love God more. Oh, I remember those testimonies we had that somebody see somebody drop some money and they say, they say oh, Lord, that's my blessing. And put a foot on it real quick right there. That's my blessing right there. No, you didn't say that. What you did? You got that money, went back to that person and said, you know what? I'm going to give you what's yours, but this is not the blessing that God wants me to have. And it shows you I love God more than money. We will go to the cashier and it will give us too much change. We will be driving almost home. And then God will convict us so much. Turn around. Bring them back that $5. Am I real real inside this house? Yes. 
we're going to be judged and remembered by our level of consecration. I learned we're going to be really just when we judge by God by how consecrated we were. We're going to be remembered by how consecrated we were. No matter how great we think we are or how much we accomplish, our level of consecration reveals how devoted we were to God. Yes. I want to tell you a sad story about somebody named Solomon. He said, that's not a pastor. He's not sad. But I'm going to tell you some good stuff about it. You know, one of the richest men, one of the wisest men, had, like I said, had horses, had a lot of wives. God said, don't do that. He had a lot of wives. Built this great temple to God. We think Solomon may have been one of the richest men at his time, right? Did all those things. And get this, the obituary for his life. The epithet for his life is in 1 Kings 11 and 4. And when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of, his, of David his father. Yeah. All those accomplishments, and that's how he remembered. That's what really counts in his life. All the money that he had, all the wisdom that he had. And that's your life told in one sentence right there. Think about us that when they read my accomplishments, they read my biography, and then at the end God says, but yet he was not wholly true to the Lord his God. Think about you. What would that last line say? Could God say he was wholly true to me? She was sold out to me. Sometimes God forbids things in our life, but does not immediately destroy us for doing them. God said you can't do it, but we do it, and we still live and we think that God cool with it. Because God told them don't have all those wives, didn't he? Don't have any horses, horses don't have any wives. He told him that, but yet he did it. And God did not strike him down right there. Because sometimes we think because God has not done anything right then, we okay. Come on now. Come on. I got to get out of here. But ultimately, they are distractions that lead us away from God. Come on, Pastor. God said, you thought that I didn't want you to have fun. You thought I didn't want you to, to do these things. No, no, no. I was trying to make sure that you weren't distracted. Yes. And no amount of accomplishments can make up for a heart that is not fully devoted to God. Because service to God without a personal consecration to God is not what God wants from us. Right. Serving him, but on the inside, not being really committed to him. God said, I don't want that. I don't want you to play church every Sunday. That's right. That's right. Right. That's right. I don't want you to impress your friends and impress people at your job and think that you all this and you all that, but yet you're not convicted. Amen. And yet when you are convicted, you don't change. Amen. And I don't want you to get all this accomplishments in your life and think it will come up for the fact that you are not really what God wants you to be. Come on, Hallelujah. Come on. Matthew 7, says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Before, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Come on. I never really knew you. God says, you know, yeah, I know you did all these things, but now nah, we, we wouldn't have knowing someone's relationship. I said, we weren't in a relationship. You were just gifted. Come on now. Come on. You just were serving. Come on. Pastor. You were just talented. Come on. Because yes. I didn't take the I didn't take the gift away from you. I didn't take the talent away from you. He said, but I never really knew you. Oh my God. But one thing I did know, I know your works. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. I know your works though. Come on. Yes. Me and you weren't cool, but I know your works. Yeah. Revelations 2. God speaks to John about the seven churches. And he begins telling them what they're doing right. He says, you know, all they're doing right. Then he says, every time I look at it, I know that works. Read Revelation 2 when you get a chance. He talked to those churches and he said, but I know your works. Each time that he had something against them, it was something dealing with inner consecration. It was not something that everyone could see. It was something dealing on the inside. In Ephesus, he said, man, you're doing great, but you lost your first love. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what he's talking about, right? He said, you know, you, you, you don't like me the way you liked me before. You don't worship the way you worshiped before. You do not love me the way you loved me before. He said, so they don't see that. Because we can play, can we, uh, sometimes, you know. I can make you think I'm still good with God. But God says, you know, on the other side, you lost your first love. Right. You are going through the motions. You are not really convicted the way you've been convicted before. Amen. Lord, Amen. Lord, come on. Amen. That's what he said, right? And then he said in Pergamos and Thyatira, he said they had an issue with tolerance.
tolerating sin and not confronting it. You tolerate things inside your life and you don't confront it. You don't say, Lord, I got to change. Amen. Lord, you know my heart. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody got it together. Look, I said, I'm telling you, you to get better. That's right. I showed you you because if I'm not going to show you anything, this is going to change it. That's right. I want you to change it. Amen. Hmm. Got a sign on my door that says, not all things that are faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed unless it is faced. That's right. That's right. Unless you're going to deal with it, you're not going to change. That's right. Sardis had imperfect works. Yeah. So you just, you were trying, but you really, did you, you, you didn't really give me everything when, when you did things. You know, I think about imperfect works that at least I showed up. Mm -hmm. At least I'm here. They all look good on the outside. But needed true consecration on the inside. Yes. Hear me when I say this. What if our spiritual shift is being held up by our lack of consecration? Lord, Lord. What if we're here and God said, you've been trying to go to the next level with me, but man, it's not about me. You're just not committed the way you should be committed. Mm -hmm. All right. What if that's the truth sometimes? Well, what if God is holding back our prayers because he can't trust us? Because we put things in front of him. That as soon as God blesses you with certain things, you're going to put that in front of God. All right. And God said, I can't trust you. Amen. Well, Lord, no, I won't do it. I asked you to pray last night, but your favorite show was on. Y'all yeah. better hear me. Y'all yeah. know, you know, yeah. my team is in Super Bowl, right? Uh -huh. I got to go out of time, right? I didn't cancel Bible study, though. Come on. Amen. That's right. I didn't cancel it. Now, you guys are for sure going to be home on time. Y'all right here. I got to drive. All right. But God says, how you gonna do that? Say, no, 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 no. You're gonna say, no, no, Danny, what's more important to you? That's right. How you gonna pray for things, but then when things you won't happen, you put me on the back burner? All right. That hit hard, didn't it? Yes, sir. That was me too, woman. Say, Danny, you know what I'm saying? Danny, are you telling me, no, no. Say, no, you, you, you gotta make, make me a priority. He said, because if you don't do it, I can't trust you. Amen. Yes. Mm. Hallelujah. God gave us a need for a relationship with Him. And that need should produce consecration in our lives. Amen. Amen. So, Pastor did not put you on the consecration. Go ahead and exhale. Are <laughs> well, you waiting on it? Pastor gonna tell turn the TV off for the next 30 days. <laughs> tell the fast for 12 hours a day for the next 30 days. Amen. No, go ahead and exhale. Because I've learned something. We grown. Come on now, we grown, right? Amen. See, I don't know what you need. You know what God wants you to do. Right. Sometimes, but some folks, the TV don't bother them. Amen. It, they, they, they can have it or leave it. For some people, look, I'm going to skip lunch anyway. Six to six is fine for me. Yeah, uh -huh. Amen. Amen. But God says, you know what you need to put on the altar. Amen. You know what you need to get before God and say, Lord, this has to move, be moved in my life. Amen. Amen. Let's pray about that. Yes, Hallelujah. I believe the next level for us individually is how committed we are to God. Come on, say it, Pastor. That's real. Yes, sir. Do we really put Him first in all things? And that's what we can ask ourselves. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and I'll pray. I got you, way.